Welcome to another News. I'm Jeff Brady. We continue our conversation with Harry Hubbard, but move from the topic of the ancient repository at the Southern Illinois cave site to evidence of a cavernous entrance at the North Pole that could lead to the inner Earth. The evidence is based on Harry Hubbard's presentation titled Lazaria Map Collection. Together with his research colleague, Paul Schifranke, Harry combs through key maps from the 16th and 17th centuries, showing evolution of coastlines, anomalous islands that may have sunk into the Arctic Ocean, and the four islands at the North Pole, separated by northward flowing rivers. We'll hear accounts from the 17th century explorers describing regions at the top of the physical North Pole. This evidence has been engraved and printed by cartographers hundreds of years ago. It's a matter of translating German, Latin, and other early script and taking the time to read the detailed descriptions. And that's the work that Harry and Paul have done. Harry Hubbard joins us again to talk about this presentation, The Hollow Earth, and early map references to Atlantis. Harry, welcome back to another news. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. We've talked about the possibilities of a hollow Earth and its North Pole entrance in a past show, uh, but it was cast with the strong doubt that such a region existed. Can you tell listeners about the strategy in presenting maps to reveal information such as evolving coastlines, stories of explorations, and bypassing some of the censorship by institutions? Well... Uh, when uh, when I put that map video together, I really didn't have a strategy. I had all these maps, and I kind of wanted to just film them as a record for either insurance purposes or historical purposes down the road. And and I thought, well, you know, uh, I can I can take these maps and put together a story if I use a couple of books to go along with it, and also some uh, books from the 1800 printed material that that we can actually read. And then I solicited Paul to help me with that, and he chose to uh, speak in a German accent. He he thought that uh, perhaps people would find it more more uh, authentic, so to speak, if he if he uh, used uh, a European accent, which he grew up in Europe. So mm-hmm. that's what we did, and put the story together. Uh, I, I I must I must uh, uh, tell you that uh, as far as I can remember, the Smithsonian Institute. Was actually predicated on the uh, um, on the idea that there was a hollow Earth that that was actually initiated and funded originally to discover whether or not the Earth was hollow or had an entrance to it. And I don't know that they ever did one way or the other. I don't know. So that was you know just kind of left hanging. But uh, but as 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 it all indicates, it, it, it's quite possible. I would say. There are millions and millions of people that have determined in their in their reasoning that it is entirely possible that the Earth is hollow, that there is a world down inside the Earth. I don't know where it originates from, but um, I, I think there's even some uh, reference to it in the Bible. But there are a lot of people that believe the book is not closed on the issue, and I guess we kind of... Uh, with that map video, just kind of exploited that a little more uh, by showing these old maps from the uh, 1500s, 1600s, and and uh, uh, through the old books. And the main book that has uh, like the Schlaraffenland map in it can you can you can see it at most uh, at many public libraries. It's, it was a huge book, very expensive. Uh, it was called Map Maker's Art by John Goss. And you can go and look at it, and they're all right there. I, it's not like it's a secret. I just put it all together in a video that became a cult classic. Sometimes when you do uh, these types of presentations, you don't know how it's going to take off, and I find that really interesting. Were you aware of the hollow earth and the controversy around it uh, before you saw these maps? Oh, sure, uh, sure. Uh uh, I was fortunate enough to have a father that was a reader, and he studied a lot. And we always had books around uh, the house, interesting stuff. My father was into phenomena, and he got me into phenomena as well, just things that happen that don't make sense. And my father was a big fan of uh, uh, Admiral Richard Byrd, Richard E. Byrd. And he had told me um, when I was a teenager 
that he was actually listening to the radio when Admiral Byrd was flying into the Arctic hole with the uh, with the airplane. Uh, my dad had studied the uh, uh, the logistics of the airplane, what they had done to make it uh, uh, survive at certain wind speeds at minus what minus 170 degrees below zero Fahrenheit or so. Uh, and and he was listening to the radio. I, I can't remember if it was ABC that was broadcasting it over the radio or not. I believe it was ABC. And they cut him off. See, he was give, Admiral Byrd was giving updates like every couple of hours or so or whatever. They would just pipe right into him, and he would be broadcast over the radio live. And my father would be listening to those, and he was talking about uh, seeing elephants running on a grassy plain that uh, he, he was explaining how the uh, the compass that they had uh, i guess the compasses at that time uh, that he that he had in, enclosed in a glass sphere was well, surrounded by liquid and that the compass pointed straight up and then it flipped over backwards so the 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 end showing north actually pointed to the rear of the plane and so he had not he, he knew at that point that they had crossed over the magnetic the, the magnetic point of the North Pole. Wow. And and it explains that in in, uh, in these old maps from the uh, 1600s and, uh, and 1500s, that once you get to a certain point, the compasses are, are no good. You, uh, you, well, you have to just reverse entirely. The north of the compass points south, and south is pointing north, and that's why those, those maps had a, uh, uh, a meridian line. If you look at them, they all have a meridian line, that goes uh, straight down, I believe, into like Canada. That you're supposed to use as a navigational tool once your compass starts freaking out. And today, there are more YouTube videos of pilots that have actually flown near the North Pole, and they say that uh, that their compass just goes nuts, crazy. And that's why there are no flights over the North Pole. Whereas it would just be a hop and a step, let's say, to get from New York to Moscow, just jump right over the North Pole. But you can't do that because if there was any kind of accident, disaster, or calamity, there'd be no way to find the person or or the downed airplane, from what I understand and what I've seen on YouTube of uh, modern-day pilots, that they say that they're not supposed to go there because uh, there's just no way to find anything using a compass. At the end of that video... Uh, Lays area map collection. I just show it's not a map. I show pictures uh, taken from NASA, and I believe 1969 from a, a weather satellite or something. And it shows the outline of the rivers in those four those four islands, the the, the Bargos Islands. And there were uh, other pictures online that I had seen that were taken in 1965. And there are many since then satellite photographs that show that's uh, like a break in the clouds, the outline of the Bargos Islands. And in one of my videos, I found uh, the Bargos Islands uh, listed as the Burgos Islands, written about uh, 2,000 years ago uh, with uh, Pliny the Elder. He writes about the Burgos Islands at the North Pole, the four islands of the Burgos Islands at the North Pole. So evidently the, it's been known for a long time. If you could uh, describe what the Bargos Islands are for listeners, because it could be, for some listening, the first time they've heard of that. It's described even on the maps, the the maps from the uh, mid-1500s all the way up to uh, the, uh, um, the late 1600s, I suppose, or even beyond that, as four islands that are like, uh, they appear such as like you took a pie and, and, and cut it uh, across four ways, and then um, took a chunk out of the middle of it. They're separated by four rivers. That's what they call the Bargos Islands, or the Burgos Islands. So that's kind of, and, and in the center of the uh, Bargos Islands on these maps, these old maps, it's indicated that there's a deep, dark canyon surrounded by black stone. Is the water flowing into the inner earth, as some des- descriptions point out? I'm not sure. I don't know. I've never been there. But the the, uh, the maps indicate that there's a uh, that one of them has a real strong flow that never freezes. 
uh, beyond that, there's there's just many many things that uh, that are kind of still mysterious. There were a couple of things also written on those maps, like the Manakar Order, the Manakar Order. Who in the world were those guys? Was that some kind of Catholic Jesuit uh, uh, group that uh, that spent time up there? Was it a uh, a German group that spent time up there? Were they Dutch? Who knows? You know. So and 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 these people were there long enough to know. Uh, when it was dark all day long and when it was light all day long. They they knew, uh, like it was dark uh, most of the time in the winter time. Uh, uh, in the winter, it was just, you know, pitch black, I suppose, um, a lot. It, it, it tells about it in these old maps, meaning to me that they had been there. And it describes the people and different things like that, the, the, the maps do. The people who live there, the inhabitants, what they eat, what they wear. Can you talk about how the navigators learned about the Northwest Passage? That's the Baffin Islands uh, region above Canada uh, from past exploration and map making. There was a very interesting evolution of learning w- where those islands are through hundreds of years of map making. The video starts out showing maps done in the early 1800s. And, uh, and, and, and I come up through to about the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then we jump back to the 1500s and 1600s. As you're watching the video, it kind of is bouncing along, and then it starts getting a little more twisted, a little bit more twisted, and then you realize, like, whoa, wait, where are these guys going with this? So, it, and it appears that the Northwest Passage was actually codified in the probably 1870s or so, but then we go back into the 1500s and 1600s and show that they knew about it. Yeah, they 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 they, they had been there. They had mapped uh, certain things there that uh, that proved out to be correct, uh, such as like Southampton Island. It was a lot more correct uh, from the late 1500s and early 1600s uh, than it was in the uh, mid 1800s. So how do you explain that? Uh, where is uh, Southampton Island? Uh, up uh, northern Canada. Is that near Hudson Bay? Yes. You reference uh, in the presentation titled Lazaria Map Collection, that's on YouTube, Harry Hubbard's channel. Uh, Just type in Harry Hubbard and Lazaria Map Collection. You'll be able to find it. Harry, you reference a map from 1608 by Matthias Quadis that has some script about an area called Friesland. It's an island. Correct. You describe the script, and there's a lot that you've uh, referenced on it, but the script reads, Friesland is larger than Ireland and has been unknown to the ancients. The climate is extremely harsh. Inhabitants don't have any fruits but live on seafood. You can find a maximum daylight of 19 hours. If you could, please tell listeners about Friesland, how it shows up on older maps, where it's located, and where it might be located today. Well, I was um I called myself a Friesland collector. I wanted maps that had Friesland on them. And it was on the Cornelius Whitfleet, it was on the um uh, Gerhardus Mercator, Abraham Attilius maps, Ramo Mercator maps. And all of these guys were kind of like in the same guild uh of Dutch and German map makers. They all knew each other. They all trained with each other and uh, and used each other's uh work. And the thing about Friesland, it was so detailed. By the early 1600s, you had uh, the capital was Bondandia, and you had uh, the South Port, the, the different bays around it were all listed, and, and uh, different mountains indicated, and different things, like you said, about the people who lived there. And where it was is actually like a, a bit south of uh, Iceland, I would say, between Iceland and Greenland. And it wasn't, I don't think it was um, larger than Ireland. Um, I have no no proof of that, or or uh, it's just not indicated. But nevertheless, uh, there it appears that there was uh, a Friesland, and that it sank, and it could have. There's a, the whole area is uh, quite volcanic, and it was in 1948, I believe, where there was a ship uh, called the American Scientist that was loaded with uh, professors and scientists and stuff that they actually went and took soundings in the North Sea there, approximately where they figured <clears throat> that this Friesland could have been. 
and what they they were expecting it to be 2,500 fathoms. A uh, fathom, of course, is six feet. And the area that they went to was 20 fathoms. They found a, an entire area, I, I believe it was like 30 miles in diameter, roughly, where the uh, the depth of the ocean there was only 20 fathoms, which is, uh, what, 120, 125 feet or so. And I believe it's quite possible that it sank. Uh, we have uh, islands that have sunk in the Pacific, in the Atlantic. I think there was one called... Uh, uh, the Sarah Ann Island or St. Ann Island down in the Pacific, that it was on the maps even in uh, uh, the early 1900s. And it was supposed to be some, like, uh, solar eclipse. And these scientists wanted to go there to uh, investigate the solar eclipse, that it was going to be, like, pitch black there. So they went to this uh, uh, Sarah Ann Island, and it wasn't there. <laughs> it just had vanished. And there's um, another uh, island in the Pacific while I'm on there that uh, on it that it vanished. It's called uh, Maida, I believe, M-A-Y-D-A, Maida Island, that had been mapped, and uh, its uh, coordinates were well documented. And then, boom, it was just gone, vanished. So a lot of the um, cartographers and scientists they say, "Oh well, Friesland couldn't have existed." Uh, it was just a mythical this and that, but why? Why so much detail then? You know, and it was on maps from uh, I guess like the late 1400s up until the uh, uh, the late 1600s, maybe even into the 1700s. So, and, and it was on probably 60 years, 70 maps. It was well documented and drawn pretty doggone, you know, similar from map to map. It appeared everywhere. And there was another reference I found that uh, recorded that Furbisher, who was a sailor, a captain, uh, that he was actually the, the only one in modern times that said that he actually saw Friesland. Well, the thing about it was, is uh, they said, but he didn't. He was actually looking at uh, Greenland. Well, here you've got this seasoned ca uh, sea captain, and he didn't know where he was at. <laughs> so that didn't make a lot of sense. I believe he actually saw it, like he says he saw it. But we're going to say that he he didn't say it. That's what the powers that be kind of will want to uh, want to depict. But I was one. I collected stuff that had Friesland on it, and and I loved it. I, I liked uh, the idea that there was a huge island out in the Atlantic, similar to Atlantis. It probably uh, just had an earthquake or a volcano blew and just sunk into the ocean, which is exactly what happened to I believe it was Maida in the uh, South Pacific. It's interesting that this island did not have the uh, the mystique and timeless folklore of Atlantis that you hear about. Well, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, and, and it could have. It, it, you know, it, uh, uh, I guess I guess I was trying to uh, uh, bring it about that there that there were other islands that existed and sunk. In uh, my video, uh, the shrine. I uh, I described several other islands that were um, uh, indicated or, or mentioned through the uh, ancient classical history writers that uh, existed, and now they're not there now, like Gorgon. Uh, there, some of them had really fancy names to them, and they don't exist anymore. And the scholars of modern day, they'll say, well, we don't know where this one was. We believe that this one, like uh, what was the, the Fortunate Islands or the Islands of Bliss, the Bliss Islands. Well, that must have been the Canaries, but it doesn't appear to, you know, it's just, it's just their speculation. Well, nobody knows uh, for sure, either way. Harry, on an 1862 map, you talk about uh, the area now known as Alaska, but it was uh, once something else. Can you talk about the story that is told about Alaska through these maps? The, the Russians had kind of pretty much stolen it from the, uh, from the Eskimo, or, or not, and and uh, from there, when uh, the Russian, it was in a holding of the Russian fur trader, fur trading company, and they, uh, the Russians had their fur traders there, and they're like, what, 26,000 or more Eskimo, and the Russians sold it to the Americans, and it, it, was, um, it wasn't even called um, uh, Alaska. It was first, uh, Alaska was first uh, just the Aleutian Islands, and then it became Alaskan or Russian. Russian territory is what it was called on the maps, and then uh, and then it eventually uh, actually became Alaska. 
So, and, and that was quite, uh, I guess, uh, uh, mid-late 1800s that, uh, that Alaska first appears on the maps as, uh, as Alaska. Let's go back to the Hollow Earth, because the maps that you present that show the Bargo Islands is really a fascinating area. I have never seen it, even in Hollow Earth books. They, they rarely show this view with the canyon in the center. One of the maps you uh, talk about, Gerard Mercator's famous map, uh, describing the center of the Arctic region as a dark canyon in the middle of the North Pole. Mm-hmm. There's text that you read on the on the video, and one quote is, from the ocean, rivers flow into the pole. There are 19 entrances the rivers flow northward and empty into a central sea, then empty into the dark canyon, then empty into the inner earth, uh, 33 leagues wide. And that's about 100 miles, the canyon mm-hmm. area. That's pretty big for water flowing down into the inner earth. What have you learned about uh, explorers uh, that have de- also described this area? Well, the descriptions uh, became more detailed in, in later years. That's why we kind of uh, I kind of show the Abraham Rutilius uh, map, and then also uh, we go into the Mercator maps and show the uh, Ramold Mercator maps, and then uh, from the 1500s, and then go into the early uh, 1600s with the uh, Matthias Quadus map, because his the Matthias Quadus is, is even more detailed. And the uh, the writing, uh, you know, the, the the text that were in these books, these uh, these atlases, all those maps come from atlases. They they didn't print just a map. The the, the maps came out of atlases, and the uh, pages, the the text associated with, like the uh, Bargos Islands and Friesland, et cetera, uh, they give more detail. And and you can tell so some of those maps are just covered with script. And uh, the Matthias Quadus maps, for instance, is Latin, and some of the others, uh, you know, later on they became, uh, you know, in German or so. But uh, generally, Latin was the language of the maps of the map makers. And so, uh, so given that, uh, as time drew on, fifty, sixty years, whatever, the the descriptions of the people and and uh, how they lived, what they ate, uh, how they spoke, whatever, it, it just became more and more descriptive. And detailed. When you're showing somebody these maps, and and they they get the idea that wow, okay, this is a, an actual map of this or that. It's it's more than just somebody just talking or 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 text about something. And a lot of the books didn't never show. They never showed these maps or gave the descriptions that were on these maps. And and you found that pretty wild. But it's it's, it's just what happens. They, a lot of people don't do their homework. Or they, uh, they, it's just things that just get past them, and it happens all the time. So that's 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 just the uh, nature of the beast of research. And like, uh, for instance, these, uh, uh, like the names of the islands that I, I described to you, or I told you about, for instance, somebody will say, "Oh, I googled it, and and uh, you got this wrong," or or the name of it was this, or I googled it, and that's how people research today. They Google it. And it's not really research at all. I, 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 you know, people will find a link online and they'll send it to me. It's like, hey, man, check this out. Check this out. I don't want to see any links. <laughs> I don't want to see any videos. I don't want to see the people that just make it up as they go. If you've got a book printed in the early 1800s or so that I've never read, uh, which is going to be hard to come by, and you scan me a page in that book that you have found something, yeah, you can send that to me. But I don't want to, don't send me a link. Uh, don't send me something that you found on Google or Bing or something like that. It's, that, that that's just so elementary in my world. And uh, some of the reasons that you say that here is because a lot of the material that you're uh, bringing forth is taken from a lot of uh, books. And you're a book collector as well Correct. as other things. You collect coins, currency, artifacts. So you have probably a, a very interesting uh, book collection, I would imagine. There you find material that is not usually online. And if you 
If you do want to get those books, they're probably upward to a hundred dollars. Oh, I've got books that are several thousands of dollars, actually, and and they're just impossible to get. Uh, a, a lot of the books. Now I used to have like twenty five hundred books. I was talking to an old friend last night, and he was like, "Man, I was just so sad that you had to sell unload so many of those books." But you can't. I mean, twenty five hundred books. That's what. Uh, uh, that's over two tons of weight to carry around. So. I mean, I, I sold as much as I could. You know, I sold books that I knew I would never read again and books that I w- knew I would not have to reference to. And and, and I did wise. I, I unloaded a lot of weight, and I still have, oh, gosh, maybe 1,500, 1,600 pounds of books. I, I didn't get out from underneath all of it. And, and I, I show a lot of the books that I have, the, the, the lion's share. I, I actually show... In the uh, video, uh, which is called Harry Hubbard, The Real Past Preserver, I show uh, uh, different subjects, different, you know, the books I have on different subjects. And I've, I've been through, what, some recent fires, and th- this is just what I have left over, you know. I mean, it's what I got, what I have that I travel with out here in the middle of nowhere. So, uh, but it, you can see those books in uh, Harry Hubbard, The Real Past Preserver, stuff that I reference to quite often. Well, getting back to uh, the Bargos Islands, how many maps reference the same thing again and again for hundreds of years? Can you talk about that aspect? I would say probably 60 or 70 uh, uh, for over, what, probably 150, 200 years? Yeah, and then, and then there's just nothing, nothing beyond that. Mm-hmm. It's well documented. Indeed, and I think that tells us a lot about what these cartographers and explorers had seen and what they, there was not necessarily an agenda to cover something up. And as you pointed out, the the NASA images of the North Pole, I mean, I've seen them, and it's a black circle in yeah. on the top. Yeah, and it's, and it's not just one NASA photograph, it's several, several satellite shots. But you mentioned before, if you look uh, at certain maps, you can make out the uh, the four islands. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Even on those NASA maps, it's it's kind of vague, and and they don't show up real good. But you, if you look real close, yeah, you can see them. Now, going inside the uh, inner Earth, you present in the video a map called Schlaraffenland. Yes, yeah, Schlaraffenland. And just let me say. Uh, as I do in the video, I present it as if somebody, if there was an inner earth, and uh, and and is it possible that uh, sailors had gotten had had gone down in there, and is it possible that cartographers had mapped it? Is it possible? And then I show uh, the Schlaraffenland map, which is uh, was published by George Souter in uh, 1736. And George Souter's maps were very colorful, bold colors, and and uh, he had done a couple of fantasy maps, or, or just of imaginary places. So a lot of the uh, the uh, uh, cartographers and scientists at, at that time they say, "Oh, well, that's just a fantasy map," and uh, even the map collectors of today, "Oh, well, that's just a fantasy map." But if you look at his fantasy maps, they don't look anything like the Schlaraffenland. They don't have the uh, the detail in the uh, um, in the uh, legends of the distances that the Schlaraffen land map has. It's got three different measurements of distance. The map on the paper appears to be concave. The longitudinal lines start at 360 and then go 370, 380, 390, 400. They actually pick up, I believe, where where the uh, the main Greenwich line would be, and then fold inside and then and then go out it's because. And the equator is the same, but the map goes the direct opposite of what you would say uh, from the outer surface of a, of a spherical circle uh, into in, an inversion. The, the map appears clearly to be inverted, which I found was pretty fascinating. There's no other map in the world that is uh, uh, written like that. It's just, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. You referenced, too, uh, the... Names of uh, the regions on that map actually have a, a, a gradient from good to evil. 
And that reminded me of Dante's Inferno. But what is going on there? That was interesting. Well, I don't know if George Souter uh, put those in there or if they were on the original map. Now, you got to remember, there's a big story behind that Sharofenland map. Uh, he came to his shop one morning, and it was laying uh, against the door. Uh, he didn't know who put it there. He didn't. Uh, somebody dropped it off during the during the night. George Souter didn't know who had described the map or anything, but he looked at it and he said, "Wow, this is pretty neat," and he put it out. Now, whether he at that time even suspected that it was of the inner world, uh, there's nothing to indicate it, and uh, because it doesn't say on the map, you know, actually that, but it says, um, well, kind of in a way. The map isn't called the inner earth, but it talks about being down inside uh, the earth to a degree, that there is a, um, uh, an artificial sun that, uh, that it keeps the place uh, illuminated and warm, and then it talks about a machine that uh, controls the weather. And I thought that was pretty significant, it, we're talking about a machine and, that controls the weather in, in 1736. So... There's a lot to that map, and a lot of mystery that, that goes hand in hand with that map. Our guest is Harry Hubbard. We're talking about the evidence on maps hundreds of years old that depict entrances to the hollow earth and Atlantis. We'll be right back after this break. If you just tuned in, we're speaking with Harry Hubbard about ancient maps depicting the hollow earth and Atlantis. Your colleague, Paul Schifranke, reads some of the notes of various explorers who have voyaged into the region of the four islands and four rivers. Some report that the northern lights make various sound, and the flora and fauna are striking. Let's hear these descriptions from the presentation titled Lazaria Map Collection. This is a cutoff of the globe showing how they sent S&P waves and how they travel through and how they determined the composition of the Earth. But these geography books also state that this is pure speculation and not fact. But they believe this to be the most accurate theory. This is what's presented in today's books. But, as is we know, there has nobody actually been down there to describe the hot core and everything that is purely speculative. Now, let me give you some actual accounts of Arctic explorers. This is a quote from Lieutenant Hooper Royal Navy in an expedition from 1849 to 1850. He says, I've heard the Aurora Borealis, not once but many times, not faintly and indistinctly, but loudly and unmistakably now from this quarter, now from that, now from one point on high, and another time from one low down. At first it seemed to resemble the sound of field ice, then it was like the sound of a water mill, and at last like the whirring of cannon shot heard from a short distance. Dr. Fritjof Nansen from his diary, volume 2, page 472. Wednesday, March 25th. There is the same dark water sky behind the promontory in the southwest, stretching thence westwards, almost to the extreme west. It has been there all through this mild weather with southwesterly wind, from the very beginning of the month. There seems to be always open water there, for no sooner is the sky overcast then the reflection of water appears in that quarter. The explorer Kane writes in his diary, As the surface of the glacier receded to the south, its face seemed unbroken with piles of earth and rock-stained rubbish, till far back in the interior it was hidden from me by the slope of a hill. Spilled the, still beyond this, however, the white blink or glare of the sky above showed its continued extension. A 
Another quote from Nansen. So in the meantime, we made fast to a great ice block and prepared to clean the boiler and shift coals. We are lying in open water with only a few large flows here and there, but I have a presentiment that this is our winter harbor. There's no reason why that progress should have stopped at that point. Another quote from Nansen. This island we came to seemed to me to be one of the most lovely spots on the face of the earth. A beautiful flat beach, an old strand lined with shells, strewn above a narrow belt of clean water along shore, where snails and sea urchins were visible at the bottom and amphipoda were swimming about. In the cliffs overhead were hundreds of screaming little arcs, and beside us the snow bunting fluttered from stone to stone with their cheerful twitter. Here was life and fair land. We were no longer on the eternal drift ice. At the bottom of the sea, just beyond the beach, I could see whole forests of seaweed. Under the cliffs, here and there, were drifts of beautiful rose-colored snow. Another quote by Franklin, he saw large numbers of geese migrating to the unknown north at a high latitude indicating land there. He notes that no matter how far north the explorer goes, he always finds the polar bear ahead of him. No matter how far north these bears are met, they are always on their way north. At latitude 82, Kane found butterflies, bees, and flies as well as wolves, foxes, bears, geese, ducks, waterfowls, and partridges. A strange fact all explorers observe is that animals do not migrate south to escape the cold arctic winter, but instead go north. Nansen was puzzled by this driftwood which is continually found along the Greenland coast. He said that as far north as latitude 86 degrees, he found such driftwood. Another account by Dr. Nansen on, on the occasion when the compass went haywire. Taking everything into calculation, if I am to be perfectly honest, I think this is a wretched state of matters. We are now in about 80 degrees north latitude. In September, we were in 79 degrees. That is, let us say, one degree for five months. If we go on at this rate, we shall be at the pole in 45 or, say, 50 months, and in 90 or 100 months at 80 degrees north latitude on the other side of it, with probably some prospect of getting out of the ice and home in a month or two more. At best, if things go, on as they are going now, we shall be home in eight years. Because of Dr. Nansen finding it getting warmer near the winter pole, and as well as his compass acting strange, he decided to turn around because he felt he was lost and went back home and ended his mission. Here is an account from another Nordic explorer. I lived near the Arctic Circle in Norway. One summer, my friend and I made up our minds to take a boat trip together and go as far as we could into the North Country. So we put one month's food provisions in a small fishing boat and with sail and also a good engine in our boat, we set to sea. At the end of one month, we had traveled far into the North, beyond the Pole and into a strange new country. We were much astonished at the weather there, warm, and at times at night it was almost too warm to sleep. Then we saw something so strange that we both were astonished. Ahead of the warm open sea, we were on what looked like a great mountain. Into that mountain at a certain point the ocean seemed to be emptying. Mystified, we continued in that direction and found ourselves sailing into a vast canyon leading into the interior of the earth. We kept sailing and then we saw what surprised us, a sun shining inside the earth. These men eventually sailed into a land in the interior of the earth 
They encountered many gigantic people and animals and a very advanced civilization. They spent their time there for a year before they returned back home. A Welshman, Walter Mapes, in the latter part of the 12th century, in his collection of anecdotes, tells of a prehistoric king of Britain named Hela, who met with the Skrelings, who took him beneath the earth. Many early legends tell of people going under the earth into a strange realm, staying there for a long period of time, and later returning. The ancient Irish had a legend of a land beyond the sea where the sun always shone, and it was always summer weather. They even thought that some of their heroes had gone there and returned, after which they were never satisfied with their own country. That was Paul Schifranke referring to various reports from explorers visiting the region near the opening at the North Pole from the presentation titled Lazaria Map Collection. And, and those, uh, what he's reading there is actually documented in books from the 1800s. So he's not making that up. And, and there are still other books. Many, many books reference those captions. So I might want to point that out to you, is that, that, that those are, those are well-known captions. And actually, those, uh, many of those uh, captions and stories are recorded in the more recent Hollow Earth uh, books. You also, in another video, talk about Atlantis showing up on, on a map. Tell listeners about that, if you could. Well, it's, the, uh, it's called uh, Oldest Authentic Map of Atlantis, World's Oldest Authentic Map of Atlantis. And it, it basically comes from uh, Athanasius Kircher in, what, 1663, 65, or something like that. I believe the name of the book was uh, Terra Mundus. And his map of Atlantis is the one that's pictured in all the Atlantis books. Uh, but for some reason, and I point this out in the video, none of the people who write about Atlantis or claim to know anything about Atlantis, they never give... What they just show the picture of the map, but they never tell you what the text surrounding that map reads for some reason. Now, I guess they, they, they don't know anybody that knows Latin. So what it basically says is uh, right there in, in, in the mid-1600s that uh, Kircher's gathering his information from Plato and says that, uh, that they had a machine that just honeycombed through the two mountains. There's like two mountain ranges there. And they had this machine that just went all the way through mining minerals. It would just go right through, and, leave, and these two mountains were just honeycombed with, with tunnels and caves. And that there was just a, a, a slight earthquake, a little tremor, and then a bigger tremor, and the whole island just collapsed in on top of itself. And he's given credit to Plato for that. Well, what does that indicate? It indicates that some of what Plato had written about Atlantis was actually removed from the books that we have today. And what year that happened? It probably had to have happened before, I mean, after the, the mid-1600s. Now, I've never seen a Plato book, you know, a classical Plato book printed before the 1800s, before the 1700s. But if, we, if somebody got their hands on some of that, maybe, maybe it could uh, even tell more, because that's what Kircher's uh, indicating that he's getting his information from. There are other history books that have been tainted as well. Yeah, you know, this reminds me of uh, going back to our first interview about the repository of uh, ancient Egyptian artifacts and the Library of Alexandria and how that was destroyed. It seems to be a an ongoing uh, problem, uh, as as many listeners know. You talk about uh, the Jesuit Pope at the time concurring with with these early maps and specifically showing the recycling of water from the surface to the inner earth and then back into the oceans and at the same time a release of molten rock recycling within the same systems can you yeah. uh get yeah. that's uh, Athanasius Kircher uh, he was just a Jesuit I don't think he was a pope I'm sure he was a priest but he was quite daring guy he, he, he thought outside the box 
Uh, he even tried working out and, and uh, deciphering Egyptian hieroglyphs. He studied languages. He was a brilliant soul, but I never could figure out how come he'd have two systems on top of each other doing the same thing in completely different opposite realms. That didn't make sense to me. He was quite adventurous, as you pointed out. He was lowered into volcanoes. <laughs> yeah, he almost died a couple of times. And those uh, those two prints, or actually the four, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the Kircher world map and the two prints, they're just beautiful, aren't they? They, they really are nice. Yeah, and, yes, works of art. Yes, works of art. And uh, there is uh, um, the dealer who I um, unloaded all my maps to is uh, Barry Rudiman out in, uh, I believe, Hollywood or Burbank, California. The name of his company is Rare Maps. And you can see a lot of those maps that I used online, uh, I mean, in the video, or used to could, uh, that they were that they were uh, for sale. He actually had a, uh, a an original George Souter, of Staropin land for sale, the original, for like sixteen hundred bucks. So they're not super expensive for for some of those maps. Some of the maps I had were super expensive. Here we are, almost you know twenty years later, uh, from these presentations. That's quite a long time to reflect back on the information that you, that you've presented. What are your thoughts on the authenticity of a hollow earth? Have you wanted to take an expedition up there? I know some people have tried to do that. Are you curious to go further? No, not really. But there's a a, a man that's spearheading uh, something. I think his name is Agnes. Uh, I can't remember his full name. But uh, he was trying to put together uh, an entire flotilla to go up there. But uh, evidently, there's a lot of suppression up there. They don't want you up there. Norway doesn't want you up there. Uh, Russia, the United States, the Navy. I think he. I think he actually is on uh, YouTube, where he uh, he was threatened by the United States Navy if he tried to go up there. They'd sink his ship. You know, friendly accommodations, huh? So that indicates to me that there's something going on that they don't want us to know about. And perhaps John Dee's even going back uh, back into his day. He supposedly had been down in there. So maybe that's one of the secrets of Freemasonry or something like that, you know, that uh, that some sailors did have uh, access to it. Maybe there maybe you got to be super wealthy to get there. And maybe there's uh maybe they got a train that goes there. Who knows? Ah, shoot. <laughs> All aboard. But um when the map video went online in uh, 2011. It just took off. It just took off. We couldn't believe it. There were like thousands of people watching it um, every day. And here we were. We had the, the old VHS uh, um, videos of it. We cut that in my condo back in 1994. And uh, and it was it was fun. We had to do several takes, and, and you know, to, to get it right. But most of the information was just off the cuff. You know, just well, that's what we're doing is reading the maps. So it became a cult classic, and and I still get e- emails today. Uh, there's there's even a Hollow Earth Society, a Hollow Earth Society, Inner Earth Society. There's they stay in touch with me. They they love the work. Even in uh, uh, Wikipedia, Paul and I are listed, uh, and and the Lazeria map video is listed as. Uh, as uh, uh, Harry Hubbard and Pasha Franca proved that there's an inner earth by showing you how to get there, you know, or something like that. And so it is one of the, uh, it, be, it became one of the fulcrums of the, uh, of the idea that there is, uh, you know, an inner world down inside the earth. And uh, um, we're just telling you what the map is. We leave the, the speculations to the viewer. We don't Tell the viewer what to think in our stuff. We we just show you the data and let it go from there. I try to keep my opinions out of my stuff, but I, what I show you, what I know, is 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 important. Not just so much what I think or what I believe, but I, I re- truly don't have uh, any desire. Uh, I I don't like cold, <laughs> and I don't want to be stranded in ice. Right, you have to go during the spring. Uh, and I hear uh, if there are elephants up there, it might not be that cold. Well, uh, I believe it was uh, Richard Byrd was saying that they were uh, woolly mammoths. They weren't just elephants; they were woolly mammoths, mm. and that they were all 
running north. Right. Okay. So it might be a little cold, but didn't I think somebody said that it it was temperate and it was oh, hot. Yeah. yeah. It, it was as warm as Amsterdam in summer. Yeah. And and I'm sure that there is uh, uh, that 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 it was a lot of uh, um, flocks of birds, geese were recorded. That after you you break the uh, the the cold zone, you come into a temperate zone that is uh, is much more mild. Something look, to look forward to in the traveling up there, if you can get up there without being shot down by. Yeah, and and there, like I say, there is uh, some people who who actually do uh, or or are attempting to put together a uh, an expedition to go and prove it, yay or nay, once and for all. And I wish them success. I would like to know. I'd like to know myself. I, yeah, I sure would. Definitely. You've done a lot of work in providing some background uh, for people who maybe are on the fence or have been subjected to information with an agenda on this uh, specifically. So I would think it'd be very interesting for you to mm-hmm. get some kind and, of confirmation. And and I want to point out that there's a lot of history involved with the Laseria map video. A lot of history. And there are people who have watched it many, many, many times. Uh, there's, I, I get emails from fans that, hey, well, uh, me and my family watch this once a week. And, and it's, it's hard to watch it and then not discuss it over the dinner table. Uh, you know, well, this, we you know, well, it well, shows this, shows that. And, uh, but uh, the consensus is people that like it, they love it. And there is a lot of history there. You can't absorb it all with just one view. I watch it, and, and I learn something that I forgot, you know, from way back when. But a lot of people have watched it many times. And, uh, and, and they still, they, they will be watching it again. They really like the presentation. And, and that's great, you know. Uh, and, and I've even had uh, producers, uh, film producers, uh, contact me and say, okay, can I redo that on, in high definition so that we can see it clearly? And I'm like, yeah, I got rid of those maps years ago. It, I don't, I have, I would just hate to guess how much it would cost to purchase those maps again. You're talking, oh man, probably a quarter of a million dollars to, to purchase those maps to redo that. But it could be done. It could be done. Yeah, that's another aspect here is as a collector, you see that very important missing information in our understanding of uh, the history of geography on this of this earth is out of reach. Maybe, yes, you can buy the books that have it, but they could be altered, and you wouldn't know what the author or the original looks like unless you had access to it. I'm sure. I'm sure you see things like that. Uh, certain things being censored or altered uh, in the reprints. A lot of times they leave things out. Uh, it's better to leave things out rather than change things. You just leave it out that nobody knows. So, so there, there's a lot of things that are printed in the um, early 1800s and mid 1800s that never made it past World War II. After World War II, there's a big there's a big change in history. And I point that out in uh, Alexander the Great and Bagoas. Cla- even classical history books have been tainted and changed around. Well, Harry, it's been just a delight to have you on again to discuss another another one of your videos. Yeah, it's been really great. Tell listeners uh, how, you know, to reach you uh, through a website, uh, if you could. People can find me on Facebook, Harry Hubbard, or uh, the Illinois Caves site. My email address is at the IllinoisCaves.com. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure if you just Google contact Harry Hubbard, uh, my email address will just pop right up. I, um, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find on the net. People find me all the time, so I, it's, it's not hard to find me. Excellent. All right. Thanks for the great work and for being on Another News. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. That's going to do it for In Other News. I'm 